On April 13, 1913, in a holding cell in a Manhattan police station, four burglars are second-guessing the events that led to their incarceration. Should they have killed the arresting officer? Just how much trouble were they in? Their leader, a stout and thuggish young man, tries to calm their nerves. He muses that they were expecting to be flush in diamonds, but now they are flushed in the toilet. It doesn't matter, he directs them. They were unified in the crime, and they'll stay unified through this. In the end, no man would talk to the police or try to reduce his sentence. And none could have known at the time that their bungled ringleader would one day rise the ranks of the underworld to become the boss of bosses in the Italian Mafia. For on that day, there was little structure and no real importance in being mafioso. New York was comprised of small disorganized gangs, all engaged in brutal wars to claim the scraps that were their small-time rackets. To survive was unlikely, but to dominate in this world and to become one of the most feared gangsters of his generation, this man will have to be ruthless, viciously violent, and perhaps most of all, extremely lucky. This is the legend of Giuseppe, Joe the Boss, Masseria. I wouldn't know a gunman if I saw one. Gangster era stuff. Time feuds of public enemies bring a reign of terror and baffle police. How did this famous gangster treat you? He treated me wonderful. This is what I'm telling you, what I'm exposing. This is my doom, 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 doom. Uh, does the name Fred Berry ring a bell to anybody? Uh, not to me. No. Fred Berry is not a gangster. He is the, uh, he was the portly comedy sidekick on a show called What's Happening back in the 70s. And uh, you'll have to Google it. I know there's a surprising amount of homework on this show. But if you <laughs> Google Fred Berry or Rerun, he did a show called What's Happening. And he had this skinny friend, Raj, and, and the cool guy that gets the ladies named Dwayne. But Rerun, when, when he had to, could break it down and he could move. And he was this big guy. Uh, Joshua's got a picture. Ah, you see him with the grin and the red yeah, gray. And, uh, yeah. Just, I know this is uh, audio, but see if you can get them a picture of his full body. He would just literally shake when he walked and stuff. And he, he was the bungler that would get him in trouble. And he'd go like, uh, I'm sorry, Raj. And he was that kind of guy. But in a pivotal moment, this man could break it down. He would do the high kick and knees. He could break dance. He would do the splits and go to the ground and get back up. And, and he could shake and move, you know. And uh, that's a lot of like Joe the Boss. Because like, <laughs> he was a slow guy and uh, he was moving around town. But man, when he had to, the, could boy, the boy could move, you know. <laughs> Good sense of style, too. <laughs> he was flashy, you know. And it's too bad. I, I tried to look him up and see if he was doing anything today. And he had passed away in 2002 with diabetes. So that was sad, but you know he was a he, he was a, a fixture when I was growing up, and, and uh, try to keep him in mind as we're telling the story. I think it'll uh, it'll add something to the effect. Welcome to Partners in Crime. I'm Bill Crooks, a man of absolutely zero consequence. But say hello to my little friends. To my right, we have Zach the Zip Griffith, one of the greatest narrators in the business, and he has been reading since he was 17. I remember when I learned to read. It was a great moment. <laughs> hey, it's been good for all of us. <laughs> and as always a privilege, the Partner in Crime studio, we have a man so talented, he won't be forced into making snuff films for at least another five years. <laughs> the cinematically insightful Brett Sexton. The introductions, <laughs> they're a high point. Lastly, manning the controls and our occasional designated driver, the ridiculously overpaid Joshua the intern. Hey, how you doing? Last week, uh, we kind of ended on the note of famous mafioso of the day, and we were saying how, like, uh, John Gotti and those guys are the, are the last of the big ones that you'd really hear about. It kind of set me off on the, on the Google search, and I wanted to see if there was any current mafia things, you know, that, like, who is the big guy and stuff. And I come across this article. The title is, The Suspected New Head of the Sicilian Mafia and 45 Other Alleged Mafias Have Been Arrested by Italian Police. And if you'll remember, we talked about how they don't get together in large groups anymore. And that's part of the reason you never hear about yeah. them. Well, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> and I really think the bigger point is, you know, we had a lot of support last week and the downloads have been really good, way beyond our expectations. Yeah. But they're not that high in Sicily and it shows. <laughs> <laughs> if they'd only listen to me, you know. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and read the article. It's a. Uh, 
Sedimo Maneo has been promoted to lead the whole crime group following a meeting of provincial mob leaders on 29th of May following the death of Boss of Bosses, Salvatore Toto Reina, in 2017. It is thought to be the first such gathering of mafia families for more than 25 years. This is a sign that Cosa Nostra doesn't abandon its rules, Palermo prosecutor Francesco Lavoy told the press conference, and that despite the convictions, despite the trials, important people can take over the most important roles once they're back in play. The meeting was seen by investigators as a sign the criminal organization was looking to rebuild and arrests will be viewed as a major victory for authorities. There is no more room for this type of scum in Italy, Deputy Prime Minister Luigi Di Maio wrote on Instagram. The arrests represent one of the biggest blows inflicted on the mafia by the state. Maneo had been elected heir of Toto Reno after his death, he added. Maneo had previously been sentenced to five years in jail for mafia-related crimes during the so-called Maxi Trials that ran from 1986 to 1992. The case was spearheaded by prosecutors Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino, who were later murdered by the mafia following the trial. So some things never change. <laughs> Once all-powerful on Sicily, the world's most famous crime gang has been squeezed over the past two decades, with many put behind bars, businesses sequestered, and locals increasingly ready to defy them. So I thought that was a, a, a great article. So what do we think of uh, Joe the Boss? Comparing the, him to other gangsters. Yeah, The two previous ones we talked about, Joe the Boss lived the shortest life. Cut down at his prime, yeah. one might say. Yeah, he uh, didn't get far, but he got far in a way. A lot yeah. done in a sh- short amount of time. Yeah. Especially for the cards he's dealt. He didn't come into a mafioso like we know today. So it's, it's, a, it's a great story and uh, not a long story. I started this one uh, early on when I read The Five Families. Immediately, I heard a couple stories about him. I'm like, oh, this guy's in. You know, I'm going to do it. So I start doing the search, and there isn't a lot. You know, you might find six or seven sources, and they all know the same thing. What makes it even worse, I start getting through it, and the information seemed inconsistent. Like, he's in this gang. No, he's in that gang. And uh, it, at first, I, I almost thought about just abandoning it because I'm like, this is too too much to take on yeah. but uh, as I broke down and sift through it, it it makes sense and I think I did connect the dots pretty well for us and uh, it should be uh, hopefully we can put this together in a coherent way and it'll be a good story some more Luciano ties here yeah. with Joe the boss you can't get rid of him he's like a whack-a-mole yeah <laughs> he's got his hand in everything he does. It's going to be hard to do a Luciano story because I think if you follow along with us and go through these, we're going to tell you the complete Luciano story before this is over. Yeah. All right, uh, I says, uh, let's do it. Born in January of 1886 in Marsala, Sicily, Giuseppe Masseria is the son of a tailor. There is little reported of his early childhood activities, but what is known is that around the age of 17, he's fleeing to the United States to avoid a murder conviction in Sicily. He lands in New York City in 1902 and finds his criminal background is well suited to the Italian-American underground. With an impressive resume of robbing shop owners and extorting local businesses, he finds his way into the 107th Street Gang. The gang operates under the Morello Terranova Sieta Alliance, and it is his official introduction into the Italian-American underground crime circuit. His turf consists of Harlem and parts of Little Italy in southern Manhattan. As a member of this gang, Masseria busies himself with petty schemes, enjoying black hand protection on its streets. So already there's, you know, like vague information about this guy. I tried to figure out who he killed. There's nothing. And uh, Tom Jones even kind of tried to imply that he didn't kill somebody. (laughs) But I've gotten it from a lot of sources that, that he did kill somebody. Couldn't figure out who. Also, at... Sometime his mother is in America. There's no mention of her coming. And uh, what, what do you think of Mrs. Masseria? I bet she's a doll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, we'll get into his description here in a sec. But uh, yeah, going... if, uh, if the apple didn't fall far from the tree, <laughs> yeah. Mrs. Masseria is going to be more than a handful. You know. <laughs> also, he's married with kids, and I don't know when that happens. So I know a lot of people actually tune in because they want to hear the love story that we paint of these guys. I yeah. think we do a really good job of uh, accentuating the romantic 
aspects of these guys' lives. But uh, so if you came for the love story of Joe uh, Masseria, it's just it's not going to happen. Not the episode. Oh, it was Anastasia, right? He went to Casablanca with his wife. No, that was Galani. Galani. Uh. <laughs> He allegedly went to Casablanca. <laughs> no, Anastasia had the wife who thought he was in the dress business. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> Giuseppe has come to this country looking to improve his station. He wants his piece of the American dream, but lacks the patience to achieve it through hard work and generational accomplishment. He seems made for the mob. A natural leader, he's aggressive, fearless, and physically agile. A stout five feet, four inches... Masseria has Sicilian black hair, puffy cheeks, and a winning smile featuring several gold teeth. Good work in the rackets is sparse for young Italians, however, and he struggles to make it on high-risk, strong-arm crimes. I was surprised they were doing gold teeth back then. Yeah, I thought yeah. that was a new gangster thing, but apparently uh, yeah, I guess not. everything old is new again. <laughs> yeah. Masseria is first arrested in 1907 for extortion and burglary, but his alliance with the Terranova family pays off. They apply their substantial influence in the local judicial system, and he ends up with a suspended sentence. He enjoys his gangster lifestyle for a few short years, but then things turn upside down. Two of his bosses, Ignazio Lupo and Giuseppe Morello, are convicted of counterfeiting, and they both receive long prison sentences. This leaves the remaining boss, Nicholas Terranova, and his two brothers, Ciro and Vincenzo, trying to gain control over the gangs which have been thrown into chaos. Their struggle is unsuccessful, and in the end, Giuseppe Masseria, now westernized as Joe, makes his own attempt at taking the role of boss, but before he makes significant progress, he's once again convicted of burglary in 1913. And uh, we really got to stress that this isn't the mafia like we know today. There is functionally is no mafia. Everybody's got a gang, mm -hmm. and there's no uh, specific Italian gang. And it, it just seems like it's grab somebody and shoot them. You know, it's the Wild you, West. Yeah, if you've got ten friends, you're you're congratulations. You're in a New York gang. You know, and that's what was so confusing about this that they're jumping sides all the time. You know, because like we could have one little beef over a girl, and Zach's in another gang now, you know, <laughs> and he's gonna shoot me. So. <laughs> In one sense, I'm reading, like, me and Zach are on the same gang, and all of a sudden, I go, oh, I guess not. Zach, Zach shot me. Yeah. You know? it, it's, it's a bizarre world they're living in. It really is. Joe has his sights on Simpsons pawnbroking establishment near Little Italy. Simpsons is no low-rent pawn shop. It's a three-story building with a Holmes electric security system and a safe deposit vault holding 300 grand worth of diamonds and other valuables, about $7 million in present dollars. Pietro Lagatuta, a friend of Masseria, rents an apartment which shares a backyard with Simpsons. During a rainstorm on the night of Saturday, April 12th, the burglars use a ladder to scale a dugout behind the Simpsons building and drill a hole in the rear brick wall. Once inside, they plan to crack the vault. Unfortunately for them, a beat cop sees a blanket stuffed in the wall of Simpsons. Early Sunday morning, police on surveillance nab the men as they try to leave Lagatuta's apartment. While Masseria is dressed in a brown suit and derby hat, the other men have wet raincoats covered in brick dust. They are all arrested and charged with burglary. Is this not shades of Galanti? <laughs> you gotta wonder if any of them could really crack a safe, you know? Like, if they oh. finally get in and they're like, no, all we gotta do is crack the safe. You know, like, they're just standing there like this. <laughs> Physics on the crack it, just hitting it. <laughs> Hit it. Hit it harder. <laughs> Masseria testifies on his own behalf at trial. Although his English is good enough for the judge to dispense with the interpreter, he is clearly out of his element in the courtroom. I am not rich, Masseria later testifies. This is an understatement. Masseria lives with his mother until she dies, then moves his wife and children into a room in a tenement owned by his brother-in-law and sister on the Lower East Side. Masseria is the barkeep for his sister's saloon across the street. The trial goes badly. The prosecutor has a lot of physical evidence, including the new technology of a fingerprint impression of Lagatuta inside Simpsons. Masseria tries to explain his presence at Lagatuta's apartment at 7 o'clock Sunday morning, testifying he just stopped by to work in the saloon on Sunday. It's a decent story, but he must have liar written on his forehead, because the jury convicts after only 90 minutes of deliberation. I bet it was the teeth. Uh. Yeah, teeth got him. There will be no suspended sentence this time, as the judge sentences Masseria to the maximum security prison, the famous 
Sing Sing, where he will spend the next four and a half years. On January 17, 1916, Masseria turns 30 years old in prison. He has two felony convictions, three young children, and no tangible plans for his immediate future. It's uh, interesting to see the vulnerability of him here, but you have to remember he's already killed somebody. Yep. And he, he's not, you know, but he, but he does seem like this loss. He's an immigrant. He probably doesn't have a great command of the language, and uh, he's just in a world over his head. He's he's a young man still. Now he's got three kids that were uh, probably conceived while he was in jail. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> while Masseria is in jail, the next couple of years are marked by a conflict known as the morello Camorra War. It is essentially a war to control the New York Rackets, fought between the Sicilian Morello gang, still under the leadership of Nicholas Terranova, and the more northern Italian Camorra organization, run by Andrea Ricci. Camorra was a dominating force in Brooklyn and kept close allies with the Neapolitan Navy Street and Coney Island gangs. In the end, the Camorra gang is decimated, thanks largely to their trigger man cooperating with law enforcement and causing the entire leadership of Camorra to be arrested and convicted of multiple murders. By the end of the 1910s, Masseria's former bosses are out of prison. It seems that Lupo has had enough, however, and he returns to Sicily. Morello has other plans. He tries to return to the street and claim the title of boss of bosses, always a good idea, but quickly finds that someone else is sitting on his throne. That man is Salvatore Di Aquila, and he is not warm to the notion of giving up his position and status. Backed by Cleveland and the Brooklyn gang leaders, D'Aquila targets the Morello Terranova leadership, including Masseria, who has not given up his intention of running the rackets of New York. It marks the beginning of the American-based Sicilian Mafia regimes and sees some of the bloodiest gang violence of the era. These guys are, uh, they're hardcore Sicilian. They don't care about bystanders. This is like the Zips. You know, except way before the Zips actually came over. And a lot of kids are getting killed. A lot of people are getting killed. They'll start a fight in the middle of a, uh, a crowded street. They don't care. So part of the, when they say it's the bloodiest war, it's not just that these guys are getting killed. They're, they're killing everybody in the path. Using bombs and stuff like we talked about? I don't know that they're using bombs. It seems like a lot of handgun, knife kind of violence. But it's just like if you're running down the street at Lollapalooza or whatever, I'm just going to shoot you. They're not going to wait for a clear shot. They're not. I'm going to shoot you right through the head of somebody else and things like that. I, I don't know that it was a lot of bombs and things like that. Zips like their bombs. Yeah, they yeah do. but the technology was a lot better by then. Yeah. At this point, it's necessary to mention that Masseria is developing certain habits that will define his legacy as a mafia boss. Joe likes to eat. It's said that he will eat incredible amounts of food during his business meetings, having multiple plates of pasta as a mere side dish. On the street, he is secretly being called Joe the Glutton and Joe the Chinese, the latter name given because his robust cheeks are giving his eyes an elongated appearance. His eyes appear especially squinty when he talks. Another habit Joe picks up is murder. He is quick to order the killing of anyone that crosses him. He's got this line, and bet you're going to love this. <laughs> if he wants somebody dead, all he has to say is, take this stone from my shoe. And they know nothing else has to be said. That guy's dead. Wow. <laughs> and it's such a great line. you know. And, uh, so he is, he's winning by brute force and this is where he comes from and the town in Sicily I think that he's actually from wasn't a big mafia city but he's obviously come by with the culture and things like that mm -hmm. but he didn't he wasn't like a made guy in Sicily and stuff like that so I think that's where you're getting where he's not the godfather and things like that he's rough he's crude mm -hmm. he's got no class he's shoveling food in his mouth and he'll <laughs> talk to you with with pasta hanging out his face <laughs> and uh you know, he's making people sick. He's got this kind of fatty Arbuckle persona, mm. right? <laughs> but and when you look at his pictures, he's got this boyish face and stuff. You, it's easy to paint him in that corner, and he's like, oh, he's the he's Spanky from the Little Rascals, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But but he will kill you dead, and he, he's as dangerous as Galani, as uh, as uh, Anastasia, as any of these guys. So it's it's a really a strange thing, and he's just young. Yeah. I mean, he's got a lot of baby fat on the guy. He's just young. Do you think anyone, how many people were killed because of calling him Joe the Glut? I don't think anybody ever did it to his face. Yeah. I really don't. I don't think it ever happened. Only a smart move. Yep. It only happened when a few guys at a bar 
without him in the same block. Yeah. <laughs> same city. Same zip code. Yeah. I don't think anybody called Anastasia Lord High Executioner to his face. <laughs> That's a press invention, I think. I just, yeah. I keep going back. To, I can't see anybody just saying that. It just doesn't flow in yeah, conversation. Yeah, that's one that you can't just say on a whim. It doesn't roll off the tongue as well. Now, he may want that to be his nickname. You know, I'd like people to go around calling me the meat hook, but I can't get it going, <laughs> you know. Another man caught in the crosshairs of Aquila goes by the name of Umberto the Ghost Valenti. That's a good nickname. The ghost is a New York gangster who hails from the now defunct Camorra family. He has carried out numerous hits for Aquila in the past, by some accounts over 20, but had some sort of falling out. After a brief exile to Sicily, he returns to New York. The ghost seems to be something of a reed in the wind. He has joined forces with the Morellos in the wake of the demise of his own Brooklyn gang, but apparently does not feel secure in this new alliance decides to rejoin Aquila and sets his sights on eliminating the Murillo Terranova leadership in 1922. A series of shootings follow, and Valenti manages to kill Murillo's half-brother, 36-year-old Vincenzo Terranova, in an attempt to win favor with Aquila. Masseria immediately responded by gunning down Valenti Lieutenant Silva Tagliagamba at the Manhattan Liquor Exchange. Joe the Boss is charged with murder, but the case never goes to trial, as Ciro Terranova's connections within the judicial system are strong at this time. Valenti is one of the guys that made me almost quit this story. <laughs> he changed sides so many times, I thought I kept getting it wrong. On August 8th, 1922, Masseria is at home on the Lower East Side in his big three-story brownstone house on 2nd Avenue near East 5th Street. It is just after midday. Two men step out of a blue Hudson car and walk into the restaurant across the street from Joe the Boss's house. One of them is 34-year-old veteran hitman Umberto Valenti. For about an hour, Valenti and his accomplice are waiting and keeping an eye on the Masseria's house. After 2 p.m., Joe, in a light summer suit and a straw hat, steps out of his house. Valenti and his partner slip out of the cafe and stalk Masseria stealthily, but at a fast pace. Valenti prepares himself, drawing his weapon. Joe the boss is apparently unarmed and thus vulnerable, but somewhere inside that insect part of his subconscious, the warning bells are sounding. He senses his attackers and then spots them. He tries to evade them by ducking into a nearby hat shop, but is immediately caught outside a woman's clothing store. What happens next will live forever in gangster folklore. Having cornered his prey, Umberto Valenti, with his revolver drawn and stretching toward Joe the boss, moves in close. An excellent marksman by all accounts, he aims quickly but steadily and fires. Incredibly, Masseria moves with a speed that seems impossible for a man of his size, darting sideways as the bullet whizzes past him and smashes the store window just beyond. Undaunted, the ghost fires again, now joined by his companion confident that he will take down his portly target once and for all. Joe somehow senses his adversary's every move and immediately ducks as the bullets miss their mark by distances too close to measure. Not waiting around for the kill shot, Masseria runs into the dress store and tries to make a hasty escape. More shots ring out and once again the sound of shattered window glass rings through the store as Masseria ducks sideways and out of sight. In all, over 20 shots are fired and inexplicably, seasoned professional gunmen have missed every shot, although starting from a nearly point blank range. I wonder if kids went around after that going, you couldn't hit the broad side of a Masseria. <laughs> but hey, who can? As Joe Masseria, safe from gunfire, is racing towards his home, a crowd of witnesses gather around the dress shop. Valenti and his accomplice need to make an escape of their own. They head for their Hudson Cruiser that is apparently ready and waiting nearby. To their mutual dismay, a crowd of striking workers from a nearby garment factory are congregating in the streets. Presumably, they are aware of the pair's notorious activities and are blocking the automobile's path. After assessing that simply driving through the bulk of people would be nearly impossible, they elect to jump onto the running boards of the slow-moving getaway car and begin firing into the crowd. The duo discharges another 20 shots, turning the strikers into the stricken. In the end, eight people are wounded, two men and a horse are killed as the car speeds west on East 5th Street 
guns still blazing. Police arrive on scene and begin an investigation, which leads them to the home of Joe the boss. They find Masseria sitting on his bed, shell-shocked, still dazed, poking two bullet holes in his hat, which is still on his head. His ears are ringing from the deafening noise of gunshots. Among the superstitious Sicilian community, word travels fast, and Joe Masseria becomes a local folk hero. He is known as the man who can dodge bullets. So, Joe the boss was unarmed, which yeah. is like staggering to me. Yeah. You know, and he comes out of his house, this this fat guy wearing this nice suit and a straw hat, and he thinks he's just going to take a leisurely walk down the street after he's killed all these people and he's got all these. What is he thinking? <laughs> I don't know. It's. I mean, it's the same with like Anastasia going to get. A haircut, unarmed, no gun. Just there's those lapses. You get comfortable, I guess. That you just. How do you ever get comfortable? <laughs> but uh, when, the, when the cops find him and he's all rattled and shaky and stuff, and I think that's when it finally sinks in. Like you're not a normal person anymore. You can't. Yeah. You can't be that guy anymore. That yeah, life is gone. And here come the uh, the enhancements in security. <laughs> Undoubtedly confounded by his failed assassination attempt. Valenti is agreeable when he receives word that Joe the boss wants to negotiate and put an end to their conflict. 48 hours after the attack, the ghost agrees to attend a meeting in a cafe at the corner of 2nd Avenue and East 12th Street. When he and his gunmen arrive to talk terms of peace, they discover that Masseria has not yet arrived. Three men that are seated at a table assure Valenti that Joe the boss will arrive soon and begin to make small talk. What do you, what do you think they talked about? So, you guys are uh, killing a lot of people? <laughs> eh, here and there. At some point, Valenti realizes that there is to be no meeting, that Masseria and Diaquila have come to an outside agreement that doesn't involve him. Suddenly, both sides start shooting at each other as the dupe Valenti tries to make his escape. Despite the hail of gunfire directed his way, he manages to make it outside. Still dodging bullets, he leaps on the running boards of a passing car. In the street, an eight-year-old girl is playing outside her grandfather's store near a road sweeper performing his duties. The gangsters pay them no mind, and the girl is shot in the chest. The road sweeper falls back into a gutter and is also seriously injured. Valenti gets fairly far down the street and it looks like he will make his getaway, but one lone gunman stands calm and gets off one more carefully aimed shot. Only seconds away from a narrow escape, the man called the ghost becomes a real ghost as he is struck in the chest and falls dead. The calm assassin is reported to be a young man by the name of Charlie Luciano who has brought along his up-and-comer gunman pal Vito Genovese. Several shootings follow in the coming days. Masseria is overpowering Diaquila whose own members start to realize they will be better off with Masseria than Diaquila. Even Diaquila's lieutenant, Al Mineo, jumps ship. On October 10th, 1928, Diaquila is shot dead in Manhattan at age 54. He had a good run. By the year 1925, Masseria titles himself the Boss of Bosses. It's a relatively unique title, as most Sicilian underworld leaders opt for paternal titles like father or godfather. Joe has been ruling with a brutal and deadly hand, always keeping his protege Luciano under watchful eyes. He's been eliminating anyone who threatens his regime. For his part, Lucky Luciano has radically different ideas than his boss, mainly regarding the exclusion of non-Sicilian gangsters, but also in his vision of a more peaceful mobster society. Masseria does not trust anyone who is not of his own heritage. He's disdainful of the Jewish gangsters that Luciano has grown up with and rejects his advice on a more inclusive mafia structure. Joe likes to do things the old way, and it is causing notable tension between the two. Soon, Joe the Boss is demanding tributes from other gangs, and not just the Italian gangs of New York. He wants to exert control over virtually all gangs in the United States. Obviously, this does not always play well with the other outfits that have long considered themselves independent of Masseria's leadership. In 1925, events transpire that will change the course of the Masseria crime family and the overall structure of the Mafia forever. A Sicilian gang leader named Niccolo Shiro joins forces with an old mafia acquaintance from Castellamore del Golfo named Salvatore Maranzano. Maranzano was a feared and respected leader in Sicily and has come to expand his interests on the streets of New York. He quickly cultivates rackets in bootlegging, loan sharking, theft, and the hijacking of cargo. Inevitably, 
His growing operation comes into conflict with Joe the Boss Masseria's interests, and Joe is now recognized and certainly considers himself to be the undisputed supreme leader of the New York Mafia. It's widely reported that Shiro, in order to avoid trouble, pays a handsome fee to Masseria, then disappears. His organization is succeeded by Maranzano, who has no intention of bowing down to Masseria. Joe comes to recognize Maranzano as a threat, and before long, both organizations are at odds. They are destroying each other's breweries and hijacking each other's distribution vehicles. War is inevitable. Joe is becoming anxious, now driving about town in an armored vehicle sporting one-inch thick bulletproof glass windows. Maranzano drives a similarly modified car, but even goes as far as to mount a machine gun on the seat compartment next to him. God. It, it, what if you get pulled over? <laughs> I don't know if you're getting pulled over at that point. <laughs> Cop sees a mounted machine gun on the vehicle. It's not worth his time. Let him go. Let him go. You boys have a nice day. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Bob. Blood is being spilled on both sides but it's the innocent bystanders whose lives are casually disregarded that makes this war particularly bloody and fearsome. In February of 1930, Masseria orders the death of Castellamari native Gaspar Malazzo, who is the president of Detroit's chapter of the Sicilian Union. This murder is a retaliation for Malazzo's refusal to support him in a Sicilian Union dispute involving the Chicago outfit and Al Capone. Malato and a companion are lured to a lunch meeting to discuss the possibility of ending hostilities between organizations when two gunmen rush in and unleash a barrage of shotgun blasts that hit Malato in the head and kill him instantly. He leaves behind his wife, Rosaria, and four children. Even the allies of Masseria are not above his suspicion. He begins to plot against anyone who could possibly undermine his authority. High on his list is Gitano Reyna, Reyna had been part of the old Morello outfit, along with Diaquila and Masseria himself. When the family fell into chaos, Gitano split and formed his own family. His primary influence lies within the Bronx and parts of East Harlem, running some kind of icebox distribution racket. Although Reyna has been loyal to Masseria up to this point, Joe the Boss is taking no chances. He investigates the day-to-day -day communications of the Reyna outfit and gathers evidence of a growing alliance with Maranzano. Seeing the impending conflict and the ominously unstable nature of Masseria, Reyna is looking to switch sides. Obviously this won't do, so the boss puts Charlie Luciano in the situation who turns to his friend Vito Genovese. It's late February when Genovese sets up an ambush for Reyna, who's leaving an apartment in the Claremont section of the Bronx. Reports vary as to whether the apartment is shared by his mistress or by his aunt. If an intimate relationship is implied, we're gonna hope it's the mistress. As Maranzano's newest recruit is heading to his car, two assassins step out and shoot him point blank with a double barreled shotgun. Reyna falls to the ground dying instantly, a handgun and $804 still on his person. The shotgun is stashed under a parked car as the hitmen make an easy escape. This assassination seems to be the shot heard around gangland and the castello Marese war has officially begun. Despite planning the demise of Gitano Reyna, Luciano shows up for his funeral and approaches Maranzano to negotiate a peace treaty. Maranzano, possibly still smarting from the loss of the crew member he buried just minutes before, respectfully declines. On its face, the Castello Marese War is a power struggle between Marceria and Maranzano. Not far beneath the surface, however, it's also a philosophical struggle between the old world tactics of the Sicilian bosses, who were derogatorily known as Mustache Pete's, and the younger Italian-American gangsters, who are more open to a more diverse, non-Italian cooperative. Luciano is still quietly leading the charge, questioning whether Masseria and Maranzano are even capable of moving the Mafia forward in the New World Underground. Complex philosophical dynamics result in many members constantly changing sides and alliances, and the killings rage on and on. How about uh, Luciano just being all business at that funeral? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> business can't wait. And he's also, he's between uh, Joe the Boss and the crew. The crew is American. You know, they're, they're from Italy a generation back now, and they speak a street slang and stuff that Masseria doesn't even understand them. You know, and they can't understand him because he's always got food in his mouth. So, so Lucky is the go-between here, and he's trying to bridge the generational gap. And there's a big generational gap between Masseria and his crew. I think it's in this story we're going to see, like, how smart Luciano was. I mean, you're already seeing it. A lot of vision. 
Yeah. There are a lot of short-sighted goals, a lot of get rich quick or move up fast, but he really had a large vision compared yeah. to everybody else. And he's functionally a kid. Yeah. yeah. And him him wanting to be like a more diverse group, I think that just means he knows they can bring in a lot more money. Right, and he saw the bigger picture that he doesn't want to be shot down. He's like, you know, if he takes over, he, he knows his time is short too. He's like, look, we could all make a lot of money and make it for a long, long time to come yeah. if we just shut up, mm-hmm. get our heads together, and, and knock off this, yeah. this killing everybody in the streets crap they've been doing. Dealing with the cops and feds is hard enough without fighting every other yeah. gang in the city. Yeah, exactly. You literally can't cross the street. Yeah, yeah. Hedging all of his bets... Luciano is participating in something called the Seven Group. It's a bootlegging cooperative planned with Frank Costello. Its focus seems to be fixed on possible rackets to pursue in the event of a repealed prohibition. Lucky is also establishing a network with the various leaders of other gangs, many outside of the Italian Mafia. Behind the back of Masseria, he has maintained relationships with his Jewish mobster and childhood friends Meyer Lansky and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, as well as forging an alliance with Dutch, the Dutchman Schultz. Eventually, word gets up to Masseria, who decides that Luciano has become a risk that he can no longer afford to take. The perception of Luciano's betrayal must hit Masseria on a personal level, as he doesn't seem content to merely gun him down in the street. Instead, he arranges to have Lucky forced into a car at gunpoint, and taken to a private location. It seems that Luciano doesn't know his abductors, or they are sufficiently disguised. In any event, he's severely beaten and stabbed for good measure. His body is left for dead on this beach, but miraculously, he survives. They don't call him lucky for nothing. At first, it seems reasonable for Luciano to believe that the Maranzano outfit is responsible for his attack, but he soon learns through his pal Meyer Lansky that it was his own boss that ordered the execution. Motivated by survival, as well as ending a bloody war that's been drawing too much heat on Mafia business, Lucky agrees to join forces, the Masseria's foremost enemy. Maranzano agrees that if Luciano is successful at ending Joe the Boss, he will be named the successor of the Masseria family. The only provision is that Maranzano will be acknowledged as the new Boss of Bosses. It's an offer that Charlie Luciano is in no position to refuse. The Assassination of Joe the Boss Masseria, an adaptation from Tom L. Jones of Gangsters Incorporated. It's Wednesday, April 15th, 1931. A meeting has been called, presumably by Charlie Luciano, to discuss the ongoing war with Maranzano, specifically on how to end it once and for all. Presumably, Luciano has convinced Masseria that he blames the Maranzano faction for his recent abduction and attempted murder, and he's hell-bent for revenge. The meeting is to be held at a seafood restaurant in Coney Island called Nuova Villa Tamaro, a place that Joe Masseria knows and frequents, a place he feels comfortable and safe. Not that Joe the boss would turn down a good meal otherwise. The restaurant is owned by a 32-year-old man named Gerardo Scapato, who lives in a second-floor apartment with his wife and mother-in-law, just above the eatery. It's unclear what Scarpato's relationship to the underworld is, but he is most likely more than a humble restaurateur. In addition to seafood platters, it's likely that he serves up extortion and the like. On this particular afternoon, he's in front of his establishment talking to a gang of hoodlums, one named Anthony Carfano. Carfano is an associate of Masseria's and is involved in numerous legal and illegal enterprises. How many, how many legal enterprises is he involved in? I didn't get an exact number, but he must have done something legal because it's in there. <laughs> At this time, Scarpato has taken over the extortion ring previously run by Giuseppe Clutching Hand Pirano, a close associate of Carfano, who'd been killed the previous August during the mob war that has been taking place in New York since February. In any event, Scarpato never accumulates the kind of criminal record one would expect of a man in his position. He's married to a 27-year-old woman named Alvera, whose mother is the head chef at Nuova Villa Tamara. According to newspaper reports, Joe is accompanied to the eating house by three men in his bulletproof car, but the identity of these men is often disputed. Joe's dressed to the nines this day in a light gray three-piece suit by Vincent Belletta, matched to white Madras shirts by Henry and Al, New York. A black leather belt is fastened with a silver buckle. His feet are wrapped in black Oxfords and blue cotton Lyle socks. Underneath his Valletta pants, the autopsy examiner will soon discover are a pair of cream silk underwear. Joe the boss is dressed to kill. 
Despite legends of gluttony on the day of his demise, there is no evidence to suggest that's the case. Alvera's mother reports serving coffee to Joe, and when the men ask her to prepare a meal of fish, she apparently leaves the restaurant to go purchase the main ingredients. Two of the men in Masseria's company may have been Saverio Sam Palaccia, Masseria's consigliere, and the other possibly Nicola Gentile, a man present in the aftermath of the carnage, who claims to have shown up later. One man who can be positively linked to the restaurant that day is a man named Johnny Silkstocking Guistra, a capo from a South Brooklyn family. His nickname has been accredited to both his penchant for the ladies as well as his preferred method of killing. Johnny was apparently skittish about bloodshed and took the strangulation of his victims. His connection to the crime scene was his overcoat still hanging in the restaurant after the murder. It seems unlikely he would have left the evidence if he were a shooter and most likely hightailed it when the hit went down. Speaking of nicknames, I don't think I want my nickname to be Silk Stocking. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, it's definitely one that was given to him. <laughs> He's like, yeah, but it's, it's not because I wear them. You know that, right? It's it's because I'm uh, I kill with them and I'm good with the ladies. Yeah. Okay. All right. Whatever you say, Johnny. <laughs> uh, no one's gonna judge. It's kind of like them calling a, you know, Joe the Glutton behind his back and stuff. You know, it got me thinking about nicknames in general. When I lived in Tampa for like 20 years. They called me Bill the Cat. It was a name I had gotten working in the restaurants and stuff because I was skinny like that uh, Bloom County character. And I had the wild hair, kind of like Zach the Zip has now. Yeah. And, and I didn't bathe much, much like that cat did. <laughs> so it was like a term that, it, it was. I thought it was a term of endearment, you know, and that's, that's what's going on. And like, once I start hearing about Joe the Glutton and Silk Stockings, I start going like, is it behind my back they're calling me Bill the Pussy? <laughs> Yeah, you never know what they're saying when you're not around. And I'm going by the name, you know, like I'm, I'm accepting it. <laughs> oh, I hope not. In any event, the Castello Marese War has everyone on edge. So whoever was there was undoubtedly serving as protection for Masseria. By almost all accounts, a man who was also definitely there was Charlie Luciano. Given the recent abduction of Luciano, the conversation was most likely regarding the final elimination of Maranzano. While the men are discussing strategy and waiting on their fish dinner, they are entertaining themselves with a game of cards. Outside, a small businessman approaches the restaurant. He has business with Scarpato. The man is possibly being extorted by the restaurateur and has come to make a payment. He is apparently unexpected as Scarpato quickly instructs the man to leave immediately and to never tell anyone that he had been there. Strange things are afoot. He was probably very confused. <laughs> hey, I got to get out of here. Leave. Leave now. They can wait. <laughs> I bet he wasn't confused at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. The you're tone the, of his voice probably let him know everything he needed. And you're to. there to make an extortion payment, you know? Like... <laughs> Inside, the card game continues and everyone's at ease. And uh, whatever happens, you don't stop playing cards. Well, these guys, when it's their time, they're always comfortable, right? Yeah. You got Anastasia with the hot towels on his face. Galani's just lighting up his cigar. <laughs> like, if you're ever happy, don't be. At some point, Lucky Luciano excuses himself to the restroom. It's the signal for the gunmen to make their advance. The hit is executed by professionals, and there will be no dodging bullets today as they charge through the front door, guns blazing. Joe has time to stand up, but he's an easy target at such close range. Two 38 caliber rounds are fired into his back immediately. Still, he manages to get to his feet. The assault continues at point blank range, only inches away, the next two shots so close that they spray his light gray jacket with a smudge of gunpowder. The next bullets burn through his ample body, piercing his heart, lungs, and liver, literally tearing them apart and exiting his torso. One final shot is delivered to the back of his head, shredding his brain and blowing his eye right out of its socket. Joe the boss Masseria is dead before his bulk hits the hard wooden floor. As a matter of course, subsequent hours have the small restaurant crawling with cops and reporters. The crime scene is gruesome. Over 20 shots have been fired. Joe Masseria's corpse lay torn apart in dried pools of blood. The table is overturned and playing cards are spread all about the floor, his dead hand still clutching the ace of spades. The floor level photo of the card in his hand has become the icon of mob violence. The famous Ace of Spades photo just added to the cult status of this mob hit. Of course, it is suspected that the Ace of Spades may have been placed between Masseria's fingers just after the hit, most likely by a photographer from the press. In any event, it does add an element of shock to the photo. 
kind of reminds me of Galani and the cigar. You yeah. Know, like, was it put there? What was that one you said during the break that wrote the blood on the wall? Yeah, that was a, like a serial killer thing. But yeah, a guy wrote in blood on the wall some clue for the cops, and it turned out to be just something to enhance the story. You know? I mean, we have the picture here of the car, and it is a really fascinating photo. And, and he would have to wrap his fingers around it because he's clutching it. You yeah. Know what I mean? Unless, like, he had a coupon for, like, chicken fingers, and you just <laughs> slid that out and slid the car in. But, like, Anastasia got up when they came in to kill him. But these guys just stand up, like, make it easier for him. <laughs> <laughs> this is what he should have done to Lucky. Like, these guys made sure yeah. that the, the box was dead. Shredded his brain. Yeah, there was no doubt. That he yeah. was going to get up and walk out of the restaurant. But Lucky's a skinny little guy. He's not some behemoth yeah. like this guy. You know, they're probably like, he was a little rat weasel of a dude. Yeah. You know? It's easy to understand a missed shot on Lucky. Not so much with Joe. No. <laughs> it already happened once. And like I said, they probably thought he was dead, beaten to death already. So then they stick him a few times. And yeah. they're like, he's gone. Yeah. Like the guy in the trunk in Goodfellas. Yeah. <laughs> thought he was dead. And here he comes like a jack in the box. It's interesting to note that no articles from the Times or the Herald Tribune mention Lucky Luciano. The old, I was in the restroom and missed the whole thing excuse seems flimsy at face value, but it doesn't appear as if he's really a main person of interest in the shooting. It's like they know, but they don't know. Scarpato later claims he was taking a walk at the time and returned to find his patron, rather than eating, was the main course for flies. Eyewitness accounts vary between seeing two men and four men seems that virtually all of the usual suspects have alibis, including Luciano and Anastasia. It's possible that Luciano's relationship with Jewish gangsters could account for the Italian alibis, but legend has persisted that the following guys were involved. Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis, Frank Lavorsi, Bugsy Siegel, Joe Stracci, Meyer Lansky, and Mike Coppola. It's also widely known that Luciano could get a man off death row, so in context, an alibi is nothing more than a well-told lie. And, uh, you know, legend always has it that Anastasia was definitely there. We covered that last week and stuff. His alibi is that there's some famous lawyer, and they say that at the time, the, the lawyer was busy, but Anastasia had come and signed a registry and said he'd wait for him, and he waited about an hour, and then he left, you know? <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking it could have been anybody goes and signs a book, you know? <laughs> I was thinking about this when I was at Mass on Sunday, and I'm like, okay, just, there's not that many people at Mass, maybe 150. I'm like, is there anybody here that I could get to go sign a registry for someone? And uh, there's like four guys in there that could easily pass for me. I wouldn't even know it wasn't me, you know? <laughs> So I have a feeling that's what went down there. Johnny the Silk, though a promising lead in the beginning, proves to be of little help as he's found dead in the hallway of a rundown Monroe Street apartment on the Lower East Side, just three weeks after the killing of Masseria. He shot numerous times in the head and chest, an unfired pearl-handled pistol laying beside him. Another dead end. An interesting side note is that two men attended Johnny's wake in Carroll Gardens, Vincent Cesino and Ittori Zappi are subsequently ambushed in a building hallway in Brooklyn. Both men are severely injured but survive. They are apparently responding to a message from a guy named Joe who had called and asked to meet with them. Maybe it was Joe the boss and he wants to meet him in hell. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't think Joe the boss made it to, made it to heaven? Really? Oh, I don't want to make that judgment. <laughs> A man named Savaria Policia was close to Joe Masseria. He's interviewed by the police, but is unable to help them in their investigation. With the demise of his boss, he's left vulnerable to more ambitious family members like Vito Genovese. Apparently, Genovese has a grudge against Savaria, and as a result, sometime in 1932, Genovese arranges to visit Chicago with him, and further arranges with Paul Riccia, a member of Al Capone's gang, to dispose of him. His body is never found. He leaves a wife and five children behind. This sort of hit would generally have to be carried out with Luciano's approval. It's a baffling mystery for police, but to muddy the waters even further, there's another man who was killed and who may have been part of the plot to kill Masseria. Camello, sometimes referred to as Carmelo Lacanti. He is with Johnny Silkstockings the night he is relieved of his life, but through blind luck has gotten separated from him and survives to live another day. Not for long, though. 
His body is found, beaten, stabbed, and slashed to death in the bathroom of a room at the Hotel Paramount on West 46th Street in Midtown Manhattan. Two months to the date of his friend's murder on Friday, July 10th. Leconte may have been a business partner with Johnny, and it has been suggested he has been at odds with Masseria over mob affairs. Leconte is also an undertaker, according to his family, with a business in Brooklyn. He handles the burial arrangement for his friend Johnny's corpse. Like so many of the characters that move in and out of this story, little is known about Carmelo other than, according to his wife, he buries people and that he dies a messy death at the age of 43. Last, but probably not least, is the restaurant owner, Scarpato. Following the murder of Joe the Boss, Gerardo Scarpato gives off all the signs of a dead man walking. After police question him, he demands they take his fingerprints and keep them on file. He's so certain he's to be killed that he has his full name tattooed on the inside of his right forearm. After the killing of Masseria, Gerardo Scarpato and his wife leave New York and travel back to Italy. They return for some reason in June 1932. But why'd you come back? And his wife made him come back. <laughs> Gerardo becomes interested in the sport of cycle racing in the velodrome at Coney Island and visits professional boxing matches here also in the complex at West 12th Street and Neptune Avenue. He also becomes an executive of the Coney Island Surf Democratic Club. With his background, probably all these interests are outlets for his extortion ring or some other nefarious activity. His wife then goes for another holiday, apparently on her own, to Accra near Cairo and the Catskills. Just why she goes to this tiny hamlet in the middle of nowhere is just another tantalizing mystery, especially considering that Jack Legs Diamond the infamous bootlegger and gunman has an estate here at this time. He treated me wonderful. <laughs> she returns from the holiday late on Friday, September 9th to find Gerardo is not in the restaurant or their apartment above it. He has not returned on Saturday either. The unknown man who appeared before Masseria's murder waiting for Scarpato outside the Villa Nuova tomorrow may be one of the last legitimate persons to see him before his death. He claims he met with Scarpato to hand over money on the night that Scarpato was murdered. After passing the money to him, Scarpato then leaves, promising to return soon. An hour later, a man named Anthony Carfano appears and tells the man, Listen, no matter what happens, you never knew Scarpato. Get the hell out of here and keep your mouth shut. This was between 8 and 9 in the evening in Park Slope in Brooklyn. Hours later, Gerardo Scarpato is dead. He's last seen officially at a small cafe he owns on the corner of Surfside Avenue and West 15th Street on the island. Teddy Cellini, the bartender, tells the police Scarpato left the place at about 1 a.m. Five hours later, early in the morning of Sunday, September 11th, someone reports a car parked under a tree two blocks south of Prospect Park. They discover his body in the back seat of the black sedan, wrapped in a burlap sack. He has died a particularly hard death. He has been knocked unconscious then trussed up with a rope in such a way that as he awakes and starts to struggle, the rope around his neck increasingly tightens, slowly strangling him. It's a slow and unbelievably bad ending. Just why he's killed in this particularly gruesome way is a mystery, like almost all of this story. The mob will normally kill by pistol or shotgun, or sometimes by a knife in the back. Scarpato dies in a way that is surely designed to send a message. If you're interested in the way they tied him up in knots and stuff, I have a detailed description of how to do that on our website for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua, the intern's going to hit the stop button for the first time. It's, it's not on the website. That's a joke. Captain John McGowan, head of the Brooklyn Homicide Division, interviews Scarpato after the killing of Masseria and remembers that he was afraid that friends of Joe might believe the restaurant owner to be involved, that he has put him on the spot. Two days after Masseria is murdered, Another killing takes place in Brooklyn. Late on the evening of April 17th, Ernesto Hoppy Rossi is shot dead as he sits at the wheel of a car outside the home of police captain Louis J. Valentine. How do you get the name Hoppy? Maybe he's got like a one leg. <laughs> That'd be a mob thing to do. Information about the shooting is sketchy, but it seems two men leave the car and then start shooting before leaving in another car that is found to have false plates. That's illegal. You can't do that. <laughs> Rossi has been part of the crew operated by Frankie Yale, the notorious gangster who has himself been gunned down in Brooklyn in July 1928, the first mobster to become a victim of the Tommy Gun in New York. Yale, his Americanized name, was a Calabrian who was a group leader in the Masseria family before his death. 
At one point, he was a chauffeur for Joe himself. Rossi's murder is not necessarily a direct link into the case of Joe the Boss, but it's still an interesting diversion in this tangled web of who killed whom and for what reason. Just why so many men died following the killing of Masseria is still a mystery. Policia, Guistra, and Lacanti seem certain to have been part of the Masseria crime family. It seems highly likely that Scarpato is at least associated with them. Logic indicates it has to do with the death of Joe the Boss, but are they killed by the opposition that sees them as future problems in the making, even though they had done a great service by killing off their chief? Or are they murdered in retribution by men still loyal to the memory of Masseria? In the end, dead is dead. During the first three days in August 1931, men representing mafia families from across the country gather in New York. They are here to attend a kind of convention, one that will help celebrate the return of peace and order to the New York underworld, and also to honor the ascension onto the throne of Salvatore Maranzano as the big boss. The function is held in the Nuova Villa Tamara, the place of Masseria's murder, and New York police are on hand to check everyone going in to make sure they're not armed. A New York newspaper reports that Salvatore Maranzano is sitting in the restaurant on a chair positioned over the very spot where Masseria has been killed receiving homage from the throng assembled. The king is dead. Long live the king. For now, at least. The day after the now famous murder, Dr. G.W. Ruger carries out an autopsy on the body of Giuseppe Masseria. His stomach contains no food, but only two ounces of bile. His 24-year-old son, Joseph Jr., identifies the body in the Kings County morgue in Brooklyn. I was able to actually look that up with the restaurant. It's still, um, it's still here to this day. I also double checked, uh, bile was not on the menu that day, so he didn't, he didn't have that there. His funeral on April 20th is as to be expected, big, lavish, and gaudy. The solid silver casket is said to have cost 15,000, about 204 grand in today's currency. 16 automobiles alone are needed to carry the thousands of wreaths, although most are anonymous. One, a heart of roses, is believed to be sent by Al Capone. 69 cars make up the funeral procession, which leaves the penthouse and makes its way to the Italian church on East 12th Street for the Requiem Mass, held at noon by three priests. He is buried later in the afternoon in a mausoleum at Calvary Cemetery in Woodside, Queens County. Fresh flowers are still left there to this day. Detectives from Brooklyn's 60th Precinct open a file on Masseria, number 113, noting his death at approximately 3.30 p.m. They finally shelve it as a cold case on the 27th of November, 1940. No one has ever been officially accused of his murder. This concludes the legend of Giuseppe Joe the Boss Masseria. All right, great job. So I think the interesting thing about this is normally we kind of trail off when, when he dies, and that's the end. It seemed like the, the murder of Joe was just the beginning of a trail of things that happened. I mean, it was just like, it had to be insane, almost like the Kennedy assassination where Kennedy's killed, but then they get Oswald and then Oswald's killed and then Ruby dies of cancer. And it's yeah. just like, you know, you've got to be looking at this, just trying to figure it out and what the hell is going on. And uh, it, it's just unbelievable. And, and it really highlights the need that Luciano saw ahead of time, like this can't go on, you know? We're, we're, <laughs> At the bottom line, nobody's going to make any money like this. You know, forget, you know, even trying to stay alive. Again, just what a visionary he was. Like, he was probably a selfish guy, but in that instance, he's acting like in the good of the group. Yeah, he, I think he did. He probably saved as many lives as he took by yeah. starting the commission. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <knows>? Maybe. <laughs> Imagine if they had actually killed him. Yeah. Like, actually carried out the killing like it should have been oh everything would be different yeah everything would be different yeah all right uh anybody got anything left to say i really don't get paid enough we pay you more than you deserve my friend okay that's yeah. it thanks for coming hey again thanks for the support of the podcast and stuff it's done way better than we would have ever imagined at this point uh yeah. If you're, if you're into the show, make sure you're following us on wherever you listen to your podcasts. And uh, check us out. We're on Instagram and Facebook. All right. Have a great night, guys.
Thank you for listening to Partners in Crime. This week's episode is an adaptation of several different historical accounts. Music is courtesy of Kevin McLeod. All sources and attribute links can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Partners in Crime Podcast. Links are in the show notes. If you didn't like the show, keep your mouth shut. No one likes a rat. <laughs>